I will close the window because I don't need to see myself on YouTube. All right, welcome everyone to the first IPLD B weekly call in ages. Um, it's November the 12th, 2018. Um, we have an agenda which I will also post on the chat room. And yes, so first thing is we need a note taker. Any volunteers? It's a call without Jacob, so this will be a tough task. <laughs> Anyone? Any can note taker? I can take. I can take. Uh, I can take notes, but where are they? Where's the pad? Yeah, I. I will. Yeah, it's on my. I can do two things at the same time, so the pad is here. <laughs> now. All right. Thank uh, thanks, Ellen. Um, all right. Then uh, the next thing is, yeah, please put your name on the attendees list if you are attending. And then really quick, I want to know like what should this call be about and what should the format be? So should it be just like the, the sync meeting like we do for Go and for JS world or is it like something else? Um, so I would propose that as it is a B-weekly, we basically also like took the time to discuss things and I really want to keep the, the round of updates really short. So I rather call it awareness update rather than status update. So really, really quick so people know, okay, are you working on graph sync? Are you working on formats? Are you working on something else? And um, I don't really care about like which PRs you closed or something. That's at least the take I have. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, like from my perspective, there's not so much going on in IPLD right now that you can't sort of be up to date, right? Like like in the, in the other calls, there's so much stuff going on that it, people really depend on people kind of updating on what's going on. Um, so we can definitely cut a lot of that out. Um, I'm more interested in like trying, we have a lot of open threads that don't seem to be getting closed out. So if we can take the things like the issues that are contentious that we really need to have a discussion about and try to allot time to get them unlocked, that would I think be the most productive use of the time. Yep. So I would probably put the like, so I think it's great if basically people could put on what they worked on in the crypt pad. So you have it somewhere stored. But then we basically, if we have time at the end, we can basically go through those things if we want to. But I would rather also, yeah, things rather than yeah, giving status updates um, or any other uh, any um, agenda items that come up from the community. All right. Um, what else do I have on my agenda list? Yeah. Um, currently, so we still have this weird thing that we kind of are IPFS, but also IPLD. So should we still put our nodes on where we have the Go now nodes and the JS nodes, or should we put them on some repository in IPLD? Like, is there any like I, I probably just put it on the on the XPM repo, the team um, management repo. This is what I would do, Stephen. Yeah, I'd like to keep using team management. Fewer repos, better. Wait for yeah. IPLD stuff. If we don't have an IPLD PM, we should probably make one. But it should probably then also call team management, I guess, so it's easy to find. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we call it whatever. Yeah, I just call it the same thing. Like, <laughs> this is what I care about. I don't care about the name, but just the same thing. Yeah, Luke okay, so, also calls it PM, but yeah. Renaming IPFS yeah. was interesting, but. yeah. Okay, so should we basically put our, okay, so then we put all the stuff in the IPLD uh, uh, repository. Okay, that's fine for me. Um, all right, um, what else? Yeah, then I have the, the biggest item is probably discuss graph sync, like kind of like we have three proposals and just getting on some like, yeah, agreement or how we move forward and so on. Um, I'm not sure if you should discuss this first because it probably takes like it takes the whole meeting anyway, <laughs> even if we start in ten minutes. <laughs> um, so probably I would like let, let me see what other items we have. Um, we have um, oh something from from Johnny. Um, I haven't seen this before. So Johnny, do you want to quickly tell us what you want to discuss or tell us about? 
So there's actually uh, two things. Um, so one is the one of the papers I submitted to the Rebooting Web of Trust in Toronto um, in, in a couple months ago was about using IPLD as a generalized framework for the DID uh, methods. So DIDs are decentralized identifiers for self-sovereign digital identity. And there are some security vulnerabilities in the current approach with JSON-LD. And I thought um, the IPLD would be a much more secure uh, approach. So I presented that along with uh, Christian Ludwitz from uh, Uport protocol. We wrote it up and uh, there are still some shortcomings, mostly within a lot of this work is coming out of the W3C um, work, uh, credentials working group and they're very much focused on the HTTP protocol. So everything in their viewpoint is a URL. And so I presented a much more secure uh, framework. So just uh, for information, I'm still battling uh, the the, group, the, the working group, the credential group, to include some syntax that would be more secure, including the uh, reserving the slash as a reserve for uh, IPLD links. Um, so I, I think just read the paper. I'd love your feedback uh, for this approach. This is what I use for the IPID uh, method. So I won't present it, but I think you guys can just read it and take a look at it. Can you link to it from the notes? Yeah. Oh, no, I see it right there. Yeah, okay, great. Yep. So I just really appreciate your feedback, uh, mostly because I think um, the current approach, and I actually talked to Juan about this back at the D-Web Summit, um, is that a lot of this uh, JSON LD syntax uh, is just broken. And I think it really begs for the need for why we need multi-key. And the, but the multi-key is very uh, cumbersome with, representing the, the X and the Y for the elliptic curves. And I'm actually, uh, I've been more of a proponent of the, rather than the Jose, which is um, Java, JavaScript uh, the encryption library. I actually really like the Jose program, which is uses Seabor. So I think that, you know, a lot of it is just the canonicalization, the serialization into a deterministic uh, JSON model, which is why I love IPLD. So I just, it works. So that's awesome. Um, a couple quick uh, questions about that. One is, um, would this actually change the DID? So inside of the DID, it references a particular public key. Um, would we end up referencing a CID to a data structure instead of a public key? Or would it still be a public key, but then when you go and look up information about that, you would end up getting IPLD instead of JSONLD? Because right now, those are really separated in the spec. Yep. So it's actually, the way I do it, uh, for my approach is I, I publish the IPLD to the IPNS namespace. The way other people are working on it is actually publishing the, the if they use IPLD is they publish the CID to a smart contract in Ethereum. Uh, so, so, and now uh, within at least the latest version of the Go IPFS, you can store the IPLD as a link, I was a proper link, so actually you know that this is the context that it is a IPLD link, so you can resolve it properly. Okay, cool, very cool. Um, uh, and your comments about multi-key, so um, just we're, we're looking at, um, <laughs> there's a bunch of stuff that needs to happen in multi-formats, it's um, it, it, it is not in the best state. Um, we want to get one. We want to get some of the stuff into standards track that we feel like is pretty much like ready to go, like multi hash. Um, and then after that process is set up, where things are actually maybe on the standards track in the IACF, we do want to start working more on multi key and, and writing a better spec for that and iterating on it. So um, any comments that you have there are uh, are going to be very helpful. <laughs> yeah, and actually, I've been giving that a lot of thought, and I think um, and I'm really is going towards the Cose framework for representing um, the, the curves. Unfortunately, there are some of the, like the uh, um, uh, poly and cha-cha algorithms that are actually not standardized yet. So they're really uh, at the edge, but those are actually where a lot of the um, uh, zero knowledge proofs are actually leveraging. So those are actually not in any in IETF yet. So is at the uh, the cutting edge. So that most, because that's actually where, where I think, um, a lot of the work needs to be is, is a standardized approach, a st standardized vocabulary. And my, my point of actually using IPLD is that we actually can have self-resolving uh, keys. So actually like you, you say you, you've created poly 2020 
with the cha-cha algorithm, well, here's what I mean by that. And a lot of it is namespace registration, where a lot of it, if you have a, uh, whatever, a, a, a SHA-2, 2 g 6 algorithm, well, what do you mean by that? That's who, who says who, what's that's, what is that uh, SHA-2-256, where is that registered? Where can we uh, uh, create agreement? And that gets me into the sort of like the next topic that I actually, and I apologize, I've been, um, off the radar and not responding to my GitHub um, mentions, Stephen. So as far as a typing system with IPLD, so like the, the, the challenge is that a lot of uh, the RDF models with uh, the semantic web ultimately have a uh, symbol rooting issue where you get to, the, to ultimately everything in the RDF world is a, is a root of a URL. And so that doesn't like you ultimately need a more robust uh, representation of the types and I think you can have simple data types or generic data types but actually as you get more complicated in the data types you actually have to have some uh, some lightweight ontology or in linked data that tells you what is this thing that we're talking about so uh, right now a lot of people handle that with registering a symbol and that symbol is registered somewhere but in the, in the entire RDF world is there cyclic representations and that doesn't work well for us I just put it in another link in the, in the next topic, which is that uh, just some notes on the topic. And you might not be able to resolve that because I'm on a terrible, terrible internet access. Um, so I just moved to Chicago and I have like three megabits up and like down and a half megabit up. So that's, I just stored it in IPFS. So that might not work too well. All right. Thank you, Johnny. Um, so I guess we can. Where's my notes? Um, yeah, yeah, we can then go to the graph sync stuff, I guess. Um, yeah, so as hopefully everyone's aware, we have now kind of three proposals out there, which are kind of similar. And we kind of yeah, need to like, yeah, find a way on like how we move forward with this. I know that um, Michael had a few ideas about it. Yeah, I mean, essentially, like, I think that we should just start to break these apart a little bit more like at, so as it stands we have three proposals that require us to move to a more rpc based approach to replication we have two proposals that um, require some kind of merkle proof for um, a particular path um, you know and and each of these are just sort of like if you if, if we first said look like let's lay down the the framework for doing a more rpc based approach then on top of that start layering in certain rpc methods to enable these different um these different replication schemes um that would give us like a much better path to move forward in a much more modular way than trying to have an entire proposal for not just essentially like the interface and all the infrastructural changes to make that happen, but also what is implied here is like an unbelievable amount of logic to resolve a bunch of edge cases and a bunch of performance issues that we that we can see happening with each of these replication methods. Whereas if we say, look, like we'll, we'll map that on top of, like we'll map that logic on top of these RPC APIs after we implement them, we get a much more kind of staggered approach. Um, and and then in this world, we can we can hopefully um, start to simulate out some of these replication use cases on different network conditions and different um, data, like different types of data. And so I have some code in a PR to try and create like a simulator to deal with that. But I don't think that we should block any work until we have like all of the simulation logic up and we know exactly what use cases different replicators solve better. We can start to implement now just by moving forward with the, the common APIs and then start implementing the base APIs, right? Like no matter what, we're going to need like a get many CID API. That's going to be very useful. No matter what, we're going to need to to have an API where it's at, where we say, give me this the Merkle proof for this particular path. Um, and then, you know, implementing the selector syntax um, grammar is gonna be difficult, but we're going to need that anyway, even if we don't use it in the replicator network API directly, because that will end up being a user facing API. <laughs> so we're going to need a parser for that no matter what. So we can like start implementing all of these things and even implement some of them in parallel without agreeing on like, oh my God, this entire giant spec is like the way to go. So Steven? Uh, I just want to be very clear, there's a distinction between like network protocol stuff and user facing APIs. Uh, so like for user facing APIs, a get Merkle path 
like maybe important, but it's not necessarily critical. But for like network stuff, it's definitely critical. But then like for get many, so like that's how much like they're different. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, well, so we, we need we need if we're going to need an API for getting a block, and then we probably want an API for getting many blocks, or we can just parallelize that that one get block call. Um, like we can we can sort of see like which network conditions play out better for each of those. But um, my instinct is that like if we have a get many, we might as well just use that. Um, and and also we want we we need to figure out like what happens when somebody doesn't have a block? How do they send that rejection? Like that's an issue in every single one of these specs that we haven't figured out. Um, so these are like all commonalities. And then um, yeah, I mean, so for the user facing a APIs though, like I definitely like want an API that says pin this you know IPLD selector. Like I really want that. Um, so we're gonna need like a parser for selectors no matter what. So we should like in parallel just work on the selector spec and and solidify it and write implementation. Yeah. Uh, also, one note that uh, RPC may actually not be the best model for this because, like, uh, at least for uh, GraphSync B, uh, you end up like getting back a stream of blocks that all look like, you know, basically, yeah, you, you get back a bag of, of data for a request, and you may actually want to cancel this request at any time and consume the data you've already received. So it's not quite a, like I send a single request and I get a response. It's more of like a I I send out a request to one or more nodes. And this request may even share the same ID. And then from one or more nodes, I get one or more like objects. Because uh, like it, it often like what you do is you don't even want to block on this request because if you do that, then you have like a massive problem with like resources used locally. If you block on, if you have like a blocking call for every single request. But yeah, yeah. I I guess by RPC, I didn't mean. Um, uh, really stringent request like response reply i mainly meant that like we need named methods with options that get sent <laughs> um and we need like a modular way to be adding those in the future um and then like the yeah we should probably try to we should be as, as agnostic as possible about what the response stream looks like one uh, one thing i'd add to that is uh for the libp2p daemon stuff uh we just did like a very simple message protocol uh using protobufs that kind of fits the, the bill for that. So it might be something worth looking at. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing we've also been talking about is like a, a new um, multi-stream protocol. Uh, and an interesting thing that came up was that like our protocols are actually more like endpoints to protocols. Uh, so one potential way of doing this is you simply provide multiple endpoints, one endpoint for every single method, uh, which allows that you to have, a, it gives you a very easy way to like tell the other side which methods you support. Or like uh, a graphic protocol could be like slash graph sync slash uh, get block slash graph sync like yes get blocks slash graph sync slash whatever uh, if that makes any sense that that may not be the right way to do it uh, it may be too complex but it, it does allow you to sort of leverage underlying protocols to make things simpler at the higher level protocols so that's something to consider. All right, um, so. Um, I think what we now have is, so we of course did make a distinction between the user facing stuff and the internal communication stuff, whatever we call it. Um, so is, I, so I, I also fully agree that, I, so I certainly want the full selected stuff for the user facing stuff, but I guess yeah, we should start with the internal stuff. So is it, um, so how do we move forward there? Um, So is the like can we find agreement on what Michael basically said is that we certainly need to uh, get um, multiple blocks and give me some path with all the nodes up to there for the virtual proof. Is this something we can agree on? Basically, this is basically what the graph saying C proposal is about. Um, I, I, again, I think we have to make the distinction between like what side we're talking about. So like, I'm not sure we even really want a get multiple blocks single message RPC. Like the way we do this, obviously we just have a want list, and it's, it's always get multiple blocks. Uh, in graphic, I assume it would be like a single message that has multiple requests, and a type of request would be give me a CID. So I could have as a request as give me this path and give me this CID and give me this other selector. Does that make sense? So like yeah. Yeah, I think that we can start a separate thread about like if we need to get many or not, and we can actually do perp tests to see if we if there is actually a gain here. 
um, and and like there may like I think that there may just be a bug in some of the JS side of this in uh, parallelizing enough requests. Like we've talked about this before, so like it would be nice to flush that out and see if like we really need get many. And like um, I don't know what's happening with the multi-stream 2.0 stuff yet, but like if we if we have essentially free substreams, I don't know if we need get many. Right? Um, we can just use the single get for that. Uh, that's why I keep saying we have the, what the, the client, or sorry, what the client sees and what we send over the network. Because like from the client's perspective, it's very useful to have a get many, especially for like resource tracking and stuff like that. Because like if I let the clients sort of batch up all their gets and then send, pass it off to BitSwap or whatever it is all at once, then we can optimize a lot of things and just send over one big pack on the network. If the client sort of like fire off a bunch of gets, we're probably not going to batch it properly and like, use a bunch of extra resources like doing a lot of overhead that we don't want to do one to like do it all at once. That makes sense. So, like yeah yeah yeah. 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 Uh, it keeps them distinct. Like, think like, okay, what do we need to actually have a like, center for the network, and what do we need to have locally? Yeah, and yeah, but that's, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm wondering if there is a constraint right now that is making us like need a get many rather than sending them individually, um, or and if that's maybe going to be fixed by multi-stream 2.0 or something like that. So we can have a discussion about like whether or not that's a good optimization. I think that regardless of that though, like the user, the, like the the code API and the network API are going to be different there because get many on the code API should actually be able to parallelize over multiple peers anyway, um, mm -hmm. even if each of those peers had to get many yeah. network methods. So there, there shouldn't be a one-to-one -one anyway. Right? And actually, I want to back up on the, the voltage stream 2.0 stuff. So actually, thinking about that again, I don't think that's going to be work, that's going to work well in this case, because ideally, like, we'd send out one request that has a bunch of, like, sub requests inside of it, uh, just for, like, uh, network uses, for packing things up, it's a lot easier to do that. Um, it also allows you to basically, like, yeah, it, it simplifies things a bit, um, maybe. Well, whatever, we'll figure that out. Agent, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I just a question, just because like I'm new to this sort of stuff. Is the the IPLD like graphs that we're talking about? Are they mostly? Are they all immutable, or does this include like mutability points too? Or like, you know, chunks of the graph are are mutable. So I ask, you know, does anyone know? You know, whatever. I want all the people who are in this room and. I ask some people and other, and I ask, you know, my peers, and they all give me different amount, different users, and then I, I smush them all together, and then I get my net list, all right? Like, is that supported or not supported, or planning on being supported? I guess that's not the way that we've talked about it. We've mainly talked about it as like if you're if you're syncing, that means that you have something in cache. So that means that like the the, the state was a particular CID in that whole graph and the state changed and that the new CID now with changes in it. And so you have the old graph in cache state and now you just need the new changes. That's certainly like part of the scope. Um, I don't know if we've, if we've looked at like, um, in parallel, I'm pulling a bunch of data and I don't know what, I don't know what the, the roots are yet. And then when I get them, there may be duplicated data in each of them. I don't know if we've so, about that. So maybe we'll call it, like it, it depends what you mean by, by root. So, Okay. You know, if you have, um, you know, let's say we, we have like the starting state of the document and every time you make a change on it, like a Git tree, you just point to the end, right? Uh, and so my version of the tree changes and your version of the tree changes and now I need to synchronize them and, and sort of smush the two graphs together, right? Um, and maybe we can pretend for ease of use that there's a very easy merge function that if I make if I add a pointer and you add a pointer to the same mm -hmm. uh, to the same node, that you know, which is branches, right? And and then the user figures it out from there. Yeah. So, so, to say something. So. Yeah. Go. Go ahead. Yeah. Even. You're muted. And now to speak. Um, uh, so merging, I think, is outside of the scope of BitSwap in all these protocols. Uh, what you do is like. You get the roots from all of your peers. Uh, you fetch their entire graph or all the pieces you don't have. Then you run your own merge function, and then you would broadcast and tell everyone the results. If that makes sense, like it's a it's a separate step. Like you have one step is you pull things in. Next step is you merge, and then you rebroadcast. So the assumption would be that 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 everything's cool. Like this system works right now, and I have something that basically does this, but it but it involves you know the two users sending their full graphs to each other, right? As opposed to you know having some protocol for communicating and saying, hey, which chunks of this graph do I actually need to send to you? It turns out there's only like five changes all the way down here I need to send. I don't need to send all of them. 
So, so in, in the in the new replication repository, um, I so I, I'm working on a simulator so we can simulate these conditions and these in these types of data structures. But like for now, I think that we should just create new issues to describe some of these use cases so that we make sure that we capture them and can work on them later. Because I have thought about this case where you have essentially what, what is like an append-only structure. And so what ends up happening is that the, the root is like always new when changes happen. And then eventually you hit a point in parsing the tree where you know all of the CIDs that you have in cache and the full subgraph. So what you really want to do is say like, hey, give me everything new um, until you see these CIDs. And you actually know that list ahead of time. It's like a very sort of interesting different case whereas like we're, we're used to looking at these graphs where like oh the the CID changed for the root of the graph I need to start looking through it before I know what has changed and what I have um, whereas like in certain cases you actually can predict when the other remote side is parsing through the graph when they will need to stop um, so that's that's like we, we can come up with really cool optimizations there we just need to also do it them. upside down right yeah. like right where you have instead of it being the root has the hash of all the children, the children have the hashes of all of the parents, and mm -hmm. then you send those, right? Depends like yeah. what you're, sorry. Um, I, I just want to say that we are kind of running out of time. Okay. So, because I want to keep it to 30 minutes. Um, so, is the plan now basically to split things up a bit? So we work on this new duplication repository and you basically split out all the, those parts that we want to like want to see in graphing into issues, and then go from there. Basically, is this a, is this, is this a workable approach, or um, I, I think having a, a single issue that just covers like here are the things graphic needs to solve would help get rid of a lot of like misconceptions and disagreements and stuff. Because like right now they're all kind of floating all over the ether, but like I have not seen a single issue that just like lists out the use cases, unless I'm missing something. What happens when I, you know, I propose something, it turns out it's like a bad idea slash out of scope for graph sync, right? Like you're gonna, you may end up like polluting the issue, and then every so often you're gonna have to like close and reopen the issue as like with the culled version of stuff. We can also do a port request. So like I I think that like what we what may work is almost like the inverse of that. Like, I don't think that we've ever really examined all of the use cases very well, and we're going to have multiple use cases. And essentially what we're going to, we're always going to be able to find use cases that won't work for particular methods and we're gonna to have to have in the future multiple replication methods. So like, if we start just like, rather than starting with the list of, of things that need to solve, like, like let's just start listing use cases. And then as we have solutions to some of these problems, we can identify which ones they fix and which ones they don't. But saying like, this is out of scope for just like the next thing that we do, doesn't seem like it's going to scale very well when we know that we're gonna to have to have multiple replication schemes. Does that make sense? Uh, or yes, sorry, my, my point is more like, uh, basically we have, so we have BitSwap right now, it works for a lot of things, uh, but I, I don't think we actually have a good document. Okay, why is BitSwap not sufficient? Because like for, for a lot of like, graphic like if you can build a lot of graphic like verticals on top of bit swap and just use it as your underlying like block exchange engine and then but, like still do like lots of fancy stuff with the graphs on top uh which we're actually planning on doing in go at least um but like i i, I think it might be useful to have something somewhere that explains okay this, these are the cases where bit swap just doesn't work for us at like the vertical level yes yes so i want that regardless because so the first thing the simulator will do is just like a bunch of bit swap stuff to show which which use cases it doesn't do very well at. But in a radical way because a and potentially you are cutting out. implementation. So and if we if we literally just said like oh here's all the things that don't replicate well today with IPFS we're going to find actually like some of these are because of bugs and some of them are because of theoretical limitations and how we design the protocol right and there's not a good way to separate those um, right now. I, I I think there actually are there is a good way like you can look at a lot of different uh, data structures and just like see well like could we possibly replicate this with bit swap or is there a fundamental limitation that prevents us from doing that like you can do run simulations in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, I'm building the simulator to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll have a path to that. Um, so I think to Fulker's question, 
Yes, we'll continue on in the replication repo. We need to start a couple issues, including what problems particular solutions are meant to solve. Rather than saying graph sync, because graph sync means something different to everybody, um, it would be nice if we just said like, okay, this particular network API that we're talking about doing, like this one that returns you, um, if you give it an IPLD selector, it just returns you stuff. What is this meant to solve? Like, what are the use cases that this one is meant to solve? And then when we when we propose the one that's just for the Merkle proof, we can talk about just the use cases that, that solves as well. Um, and then then instead of talking about like graph sync, which literally means a different thing to every person that I've talked to, um, we're talking about like specific APIs. Um, also, concurrent to all of this, we need to break off the selector spec into its own spec and have a thread there about that. Okay, so I think, so my takeaway is that I think it's a good idea to basically, so we have so many use cases in mind that we start with, yeah, some API and then you just describe the use case that it solves instead of the other way around. I think that's a good idea to at least, yeah, cover many use cases. Um, yeah, I think that's good. All right, um, so do we have any action items for the next two weeks for like graph sync? So, I, so I, I will spend my time on graph sync, but I will guess I will closely work with um, Michael on it and yeah, figure something out. <laughs> um, all right, um, is there anything else? Because we're already like seven minutes over, so. Johnny has some stuff. If I don't see any hands. Yeah, I think we covered them all. I just uh, appreciate some feedback. If you guys read the, um, the I, res I responded to Stephen's issue finally. And uh, if you guys could give me some feedback on the paper, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. Cool. I'm taking a look at your notes. All right, then uh, thanks for joining. And we'll see us again at the same time in two weeks. Goodbye, everyone.